Designers are continually looking for new and innovative ways to create beautiful livable spaces that are environmentally responsible and more recently resilient to disturbances. Increasingly designers on the leading edge are looking to nature for this inspiration as a way of disrupting their traditional thinking and helping to see opportunities where previously there were only challenges. All around us, ecosystems and the well-adapted creatures that inhabit them deal with the same challenges we do and harness the same abundances, but they do so in ways that are highly resource efficient, use locally available materials and energy, and adapt and evolve through changing conditions. And we can do the same. We can create water infrastructure that treats water as the precious resource it is rather than a waste product to be disposed of. We can create energy strategies that harness from abundant sunlight and air rather than digging up fossil sunlight from miles below the surface to pollute the air that we breathe. We can leverage synergies so that the waste of one is truly food for another. And we can be prepared to weather disturbances, even the unexpected. And you can do this too by learning how to ask nature. In this introductory presentation, I'm gonna give you a few stories and a few examples and hopefully inspire you to want to learn more about how nature can inspire the development of your career so that you can create naturally sustainable, inherently resilient environments. And this practice that we call biomimicry starts by asking questions and reawakens our childhood curiosity. You know, in any innovation practice, we start by asking questions. What is the challenge that we're solving for? And in this practice, we're asking, how would nature solve this challenge? And asking this question really broadens our solution space and opens up possibilities that we may not have even considered. We start to ask the question, how does nature mitigate flooding? Urban flooding as we know it is the result of ecosystem services previously done by forests, prairies, and marshes that have been destroyed. And where there was once layers of canopies of leaves to slow the flow of the water and break it down before it ever hit the forest or the prairie floor, there's now hard lines and impermeable surfaces. And water has to go somewhere. So we can start to ask the question, how can our cities mitigate flooding by learning from our local ecosystems? How does nature self cool? This bark is the surface of one of our native oaks and it is tough, flexible. It's a breathable, multifunctional surface that serves to keep the rest of the trunk and the water that moves inside nice and cool. And it does this in one way by having alternating surfaces. So this rough textured bark alternates between the shade, which is cooler and the sunny areas, which is hot which stimulates a convection of air and transports heat away from the bark surface. So we can start to think about self-cooling surfaces on our buildings by learning from our native oak trees. How does nature recycle materials? Deciduous trees are a great example of how nature uses closed loop systems to recycle materials. And they were done at different scales. So for example, the green that's in chlorophyll is what trees use to create energy through photosynthesis. And it's a nitrogen rich material that is very difficult for, it's expensive for the trees because they can't make it themselves. And so every fall, they will, the trees will pull back that green chlorophyll into its branches and store it for use there locally in the next season. But the leaf structure itself, made of abundant carbon and hydrogen, is more easily accessible. And so the trees allow the leaves to fall to the floor where they are decomposed by a variety of soil organisms, broken down into smaller and smaller components so that the trees could take them up the next year. This is quite the contrast from our landfills where nothing decomposes. So how can our businesses learn to recycle materials like deciduous trees do? This practice that we call biomimicry involves figuring out what your real challenge is. What is the challenge you're trying to solve for? really distilling that function and then asking the question, how would nature solve this? In doing so, we can create low energy buildings that based on the convective cooling of termite mounds, efficient, low turbulence energy generation by emulating whale fins and truly emulating photosynthesis itself. 
the core idea is that you know nature has already solved many of the problems that we're trying to solve for energy generation food production climate control transportation resilience to quote janine benyus the biological world has found out what works what is appropriate and most importantly what lasts here on earth and this practice of biomimicry gives us the opportunity to use our own human cleverness to shortcut the process of evolution and emulate life strategies life's forms processes and systems so what does this mean for the real world what does it mean to emulate life's forms processes and systems to create more sustainable resilient design well, let's start with form. We've, for millennia, we've been emulating life's forms from Greek Corinthian columns all the way to Calatrava's iconic biomorphic structures. And in biomimicry, we're seeking to emulate forms, but we also want to emulate the inherent sustainability. In this case, material conservation strategies that also go along with those forms. Architect Michael Paulin says that in nature, materials are expensive, but shape is free because shape is baked into the DNA, the blueprint of the organism, but materials are expensive. They have to go out and get them. So when he was working on the Eden Project at Grimshaw, they were really looking at these structures, these structures in nature and how structures are created in nature that are able to be strong, but also lightweight and using the least amount of material. And so they were heavily influenced by Buckminster Fuller's geodesic domes, which of course are based on honeycomb. And if you were to take spheres and try to place them next to each other and then draw walls around them that use the least amount of material, a hexagon is the structure that you would create. So it's a very, they're able to hold very, very heavy loads of honey using the least amount of material. And when you're designing an indoor bio museum on the side of an abandoned quarry, Using the least amount of material will mean that you get the maximum amount of light into the space. And in fact, in this project, the, light, the weight of the air inside is actually more, is actually heavier than the weight of the structure itself. Emulate nature's forms, but it's also important to emulate how those forms were created. So the material conservation strategies of the structures. Or also, how does nature perform other critical functions that our built environment needs to, needs to perform? So, for example, water reclamation. These are the famous eco-machines designed by John Todd Ecological Design. This one's installed at a conference center at the Omega Center for Sustainable Living in Rhinebeck, New York. And it emulates a wetland and how a wetland processes and treats and filters water to a potable standard. In this particular case, there are a series of outdoor constructed wetlands, tanks, greenhouses. It's able to process up to 52,000 gallons of water a day into a potable standard, returning it back to the aquifer and doing so using solar energy and without any use of ex external chemicals. So we've looked at the forms that nature makes. We've looked at the processes by which they're made. And now we really need to look at the system. How do these designs fit in with the overall context? And as practitioners in the environment, this is really the level at which we operate because buildings are nested systems. They are systems in and of themselves with multiple moving parts. They house us, we are systems. And they also fit in with the larger context of the neighborhood, the cities, the region, the country. So we need to be challenging ourselves to think about how can our buildings fit in with these larger systems and be more sustainable and resilient as the ecosystems that they inhabit are. So a really great example of this currently under construction is the William Jefferson Clinton Children's Center in Haiti. This was designed and commissioned after the 2010 earthquake. And so they were really looking to create a building that was resilient and also beautiful. And so they looked at the culturally significant Kapok tree and they were really inspired by its branching structure. And they created this, um, this boundary layer that, of structure that holds the balconies. And these balconies really create the area for, they shade the interior, they allow for daylight and natural ventilation. So really kind of taking how 
not only the form of the tree, but also what a tree does for a building. But they also wanted to look at the building systems because these systems, they needed to be resilient, not only to the short-term consequences of a natural disaster, but also to the long-term consequences of a building that inhabits a country with an unreliable building or unreliable energy and water infrastructure. So they really wanted the building to have to be self-sufficient with its water. So it collects and treats and stores all its water on site. It also has renewable energy that not only feeds the building, but also powers taking excess energy and powering the street lights and charging stations on the street. So, and they also, of course, because this is a seismic area, they have safe zones and roof gardens and all of the things that are going to make this into a beautiful, safe, and reliable place for these children to live, which is, of course, the ultimate goal of this building and this system. So this process of emulating life's forms, processes, and systems is the mechanism by which we as designers can begin to create truly res sustainable, resilient environments. And our end goal is really to emulate life at its deepest level. You know, life in the process of meeting its own needs creates the structure and provides the nutrients for other organisms to survive and to thrive. And that should be the standard by which we hold our own success. Can the, the challenge that we set for ourselves be to create environments that create conditions conducive to life? So we can start to create buildings like trees and cities like forests and see our built environment as systems that fit in with the other systems that it, it touches, both large and small, and perform as well as the ecosystems that they inhabit using clean energy, less materials, cleaning the air and the water, and providing habitat for other creatures so that our built environment can actually be a force for good and help restore the planet and our world. And this is the power of learning from nature. The world truly is our classroom and a rich source of inspiration. We start this practice by going outside and by quieting our cleverness and listening to billions of years of knowledge, and then beginning to emulate what we see. And you can do this too. Prairie Labs immersion courses give you the opportunity to immerse yourself in the naturally sustainable, inherently resilient native ecosystems that we share our region with. And we'll give you the tools that you need to translate these lessons to the built environment. You can earn up to eight continuing education units while walking the prairies with a biomimic and ecologist and learn about how nature can inspire truly sustainable, restorative design. We would love for you to join us. And in the process of having a great time, learn lessons that you can bring back to work for you by creating a framework and a mindset that make achieving green building benchmark standards intuitive and natural. Visit prairielab.com immersion for more information.